Today we're starting a new series. That's our Christmas series, since I'm in a Christmas jacket. And we're talking about, the title of our series is, He is Here. Say with me if you would. He is here. In my imagination as I read the, the Bible, I always wonder if things would be different. Because we look at the text and we read the stories and we look at the, the birth of Jesus and we think, my goodness, I would have made sure I was around. And yet we know the story that he was born in a little manger without a crowd or parade. I look at the text as Jesus ministered on this earth and, I, and the, the people followed him, but most followed him because they were either trying to accuse him or get something from him. They recognized him as a person but didn't recognize his true identity. And I, I look at the text and have you ever done that thought, man, how in the world could you see somebody, flesh and blood, and see the miracles he did and not recognize who he is? He is here. The celebration of the angel choir to the shepherds in the Luke's gospel, as they were just minding their own business at night, and all of a sudden an angel shows up and says, today is the day, tonight is the night. And then an angel, a, a, a choir so big that they can't even count, appears and begins to sing. If the first angel didn't freak you out, you know that choir must have made them wet themselves. Let's be real. They had to think, oh no, what's happening now? Well, what was the declaration? He is here. Many times people miss out. They don't recognize. He could be right in front of them, feeding 5,000 men, not counting women or children, healing the leper, raising the dead. And even th with every sign and indication that there's something unique, they missed out, many missed out. Their hearts were hardened, eyes were closed, ears were deaf, call it what you want. They missed out on what he was trying to do. As we move into our day and time, I think that many Christians love God going to heaven. But if we're not careful, my friend, we can miss out on what the Lord's trying to do in our lives. We see people experience stuff, we see people achieve stuff, we see people receive stuff, and many times we'll walk away and say, why them? And it's not always them, sometimes it's what they're able to recognize. So our goal for this series is just not to celebrate an event or to have something that makes us laugh and cheer the Christmas holidays, but to bring back the reality of Jesus within the context of not only Christmas, but in our Christian walk. So we can begin to recognize on a regular basis that he is here. Because until we get to that place, we'll miss out on what he has for us. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I thank you for every person of the sound of my voice. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. I thank you, Father, for your presence, your assignment. And so we ask boldly today, by the blood of Jesus, by the authority that named for the windows of heaven, heaven to be opened up today, that light would shine, truth would reveal, that our hearts would be touched, that our world would be changed, that our, that our lives would be empowered and strengthened by the reality of who you are and who you've called us to be and what you've called us to receive. Let no person on the sound of my voice walk away from this place not with the, without the opportunity of experiencing you in a special, powerful way. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and it's in your name we ask. And everybody said if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. 
verse 23. You can look at the screen or you can check, download the, the notes in the app on your phone or your iPad if you want. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, King James translation, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with us. God with us. Say with me. God, God with, with us. Me. Say it this way. Say, God, God with, with me. me. Man, you, you sound fantastic today. So many things are playing out here. So many moving parts. So many layers. So many, uh, so many different spectrums to the, the introduction of Jesus. God becomes in the flesh the virgin birth. Jesus coming. There's so many things we can approach this. But one key element that's brought out in, in this text that we want to focus on for this series is that God was coming to the earth. God with us. Every other, every other religion, when they refer to deity, it's their God and he's far from the people. They can't get to the people. But there's all this requirements for them to do so that they are not being punished by their God. And yet our Bible, when it talks about the true God, the only God, he didn't say, I want you to jump through a lot of hoops just to make me happy. He said, I I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm the one that's going to pay the price. I'm the one that's going to send my son to the cross. I'm the one that's going to experience what you experience. I'm coming in the flesh so that I could deal with something that you could never deal with on your own. Many people in this day and age, and I've heard it said on TV, I see bumper stickers and all this, and they talk about there has to be more than one way to get to heaven. Heard one person say, who was famous, and I'll not mention their name, saying it would be unfair for God just to give only one way to get to heaven. All these other religions sh should all have their own doorway to get to heaven. And yet the Bible says very clearly, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is only one way. To have your sins forgiven. There is only one way to miss hell and go to heaven. There is only one way to be part of the family of God. And that's through Jesus. Yes. Say Jesus. Jesus. Doesn't that just sound nice? I like to look at it from a practical. You might think, well, how come? It would be, it would be equivalent or similar to if you went to a very nice expensive restaurant and they pulled out a menu and you, they didn't even have the prices on it and yet you were so hungry you ordered three or four appetizers, two entrees, four or five desserts, come on somebody. All, and, you got, and at the end of it they gave you a bill and you saw, you saw the bill was so much money that even your credit card didn't have a limit that high. Come on somebody. You knew you were in problems now. You, you had a debt that you cannot pay. You can't blame somebody else because you knew it was a debt that you incurred. You ordered it. And so you sit there wondering, questioning, stressing, what am I going to do as the waiter or waitress looks at you and saying, don't, no rush, just pay this bill when you can. And they stand there at the table waiting for you to hand them something. Well, give me a few more minutes as you're trying to figure things out. Could you imagine if somebody walked in and recognized you and said, listen, and they had the ability and the desire to pay your bill. And say, you know what, it's good to see you. I just, I want to be a blessing to you. Let me pay your bill. Could you imagine the generosity of that? You've just had a, a, a bill, a debt that is so expensive that even with all your potential credit card, credit lines, you could not pay it. And somebody walked in the situation and said, let me take care of this for you. Oh, the generosity of God. But what would be more unusual is if you would stop and say, wait a minute, no, 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 no. There's got to be more than one person that wants to pay this bill. There's got to be another way to pay this bill. Nope. See, what we have to realize is that sin is considered like a debt. It was a debt that no matter how good you tried to live, it was never enough to pay the bill. Jesus is the only one because he was spotless, he was flawless, he was perfect in the sight of God. He's the only one that could pay that bill by dying on the cross of Calvary. Nobody else could. 
God gave, gave humanity in the Old Testament the opportunity to prove his point. That's why the Bible tells us that the law, the Old Testament, the law, the law wasn't the idea, the direction, the destination. The law was a, a season of time that was, the Bible refers to it as a tutor. Why would we, why would humanity need a tutor? Because they weren't understanding. You get a tutor where you need help on the subject. And it was a tutor to let humanity know that they couldn't, no matter how hard they tried, they could not ever pay the price or be righteous on their own. It's like God giving a span of time and saying, okay, if you think you don't need me, if you think you can do it on your own, here you go. I'm going to give you a time. And they tried, and they tried, and they tried. But if you failed in one sin, you are now under the price of all sin. So people say, I'm a good person. God should accept me. Listen, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Because if you lied once, excuse me, if you lied once, then you are under the curse of sin. If you, if you failed once, one time, well, I haven't lied in a long time. You've lied, and all of a sudden now, because of that, you were under the curse of sin. That's why we need a Savior. Because perfection is not by us. Perfection is by him. Forgiveness, righteousness is not based on your ability. Righteousness is based on his ability. And he said, listen, I'm going to come in and I'm going to pay that debt willingly. All he asks you to do is to let him have it. Here you go. God with us. Hmm. Usually in most churches, in most Christian circles, we stop with the reality of our forgiveness. And that is an important point. Don't misunderstand me. That is an important fact that we should, we should celebrate and recognize that because of Jesus, we can have our sins forgiven. Because of Jesus, we can go to heaven. Because of Jesus, can I get an amen from somebody? Because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, because he came to the earth in the flesh, because of Jesus, we can go to heaven. But for some, that's the level of their stopping. That's the level that's as far as they go. And they miss out on what is actually available to them. God with us. We find in this text that God was doing something that was so incredible, so amazing. It was inconceivable to the natural mind. How God could come in the flesh, that God could be amongst humanity. But even more, God can be in us. God with us. Before we can go with him, he needs to come with us. And there's something here within the context that many of us overlook or sometimes have forgotten. And the reality that we got to bring back to this whole season of our lives is that God's presence is real. God wants to be in your life. This is not a weird thing. This is not a woo thing. This is not a squinting and being weird and different and talking different. This is the reality, the tangibility of the presence of God in your life. There's something that happens when you recognize that God is with you today. We could talk all day and quote scripture where Jesus said, I am with you always. We could talk about Paul saying that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But yet sometimes in the mundane of life, in the routine of life, in the problem solving of life, we put him aside. We forget that the reality is that as believers, as Christians, we are not only going to heaven, but we have God here with us on the earth today. God with us. What makes us unique, and Peter tells us in his book, that what makes us a peculiar people, have you ever read that scripture, that we are a peculiar people. It's not that we dress weird. Don't make fun of my jacket today. It's not that we maybe talk weird or dress weird or our hair is weird. It, it is or that we stand out as people that don't know how to stay in style. Everybody's in style, in my opinion. You just got to find what decade. And do your own style. If you like the 80s, stick with it. On a side note, I, I get sometimes the, the, the most unusual comments in my own life over my hair. It's the weirdest thing. It's just hair. People that I don't know out in public. 
We'll walk up and give me the weirdest comments. It's like they either love it or they hate it. Some people are like, oh, I love your haircut. Okay, thank you. I mean, I was in the Philippines walking across the street, and the police officer that was doing traffic said, I like your haircut. Okay, officer. I mean, what are you doing? Are you going to argue with a police officer in a foreign country? If you like it, that's how I'm happy. But I've had people walk up and just give me the craziest responses. And one lady at a wedding came up and said, got right in my face, a dear grandma, praise God and God bless all grandmas, dear grandma, she's probably a great, great grandma, and she got right in my face and said, were you going to tell me the story? (laughs) Um, Story about, about your hair, what's the story? It's a haircut? Did you make that up, or did you see somebody else with it? (laughs) Crazy. I went to a volleyball game for my daughter, and some strange lady that I don't even know, a grandma again, walked up and she, I I don't even know this person, walked up and out of the blue said, oh, my son used to have a crazy haircut like that many years ago. (laughs) God bless you. God bless you. It's amazing. That's not what God is referring to. In fact, I ran into, um, since I'm on this story now, I'm going to just kind of have some therapy for myself. I was, I was at Costco one day and ran into a relative that I hadn't seen in a long, long time. A relative, family member, extended, out there. Some people you love, you love them from afar. And I ran over, and I just saw them, and I recognized them from a distance. I walked over to say hi. First thing out of their mouth was, I heard you had a crazy haircut. <laughs> Not even a, hello, good to see you. How you're doing? How's the family? It's amazing. What kind of weird things people can make a big issue. Have you ever noticed people will make sometimes take minor things and make a big thing out of it? And sometimes people have taken scripture and totally blown it way out of proportion. Peculiar doesn't mean that you're weird. Peculiar means that literally you're cut above the rest. That's what that means. But here's why. Here's a key element why. Are you listening to me? It's not because you're competing and comparing and trying to drive something better than somebody. And God doesn't mind you having stuff. He just doesn't want stuff to have you. We see it being played out. Not only throughout the New Testament, but we'll go all the way back to the Old Testament. When God was bringing Israel, and he had delivered them from Egypt, the strongest at their time, at the time, the most powerful, dominating nation on the planet. By riches, by military, they were the the supreme ruling nation. And they had enslaved the people of God. What once was a blessing became a curse when leadership changed and did not know Joseph nor his God. And in the context that God said, I I want you to let my people go and refer to Israel as his son. You do not, if you do not release my son, I will kill your son, he told them. Release my son. God is a merciful God. He is a loving God. But don't touch his children. That doesn't get taught to often. Everybody in this day and age, don't, no, not everybody, not you, but a lot of, the, a lot of our culture is so touchy-feely. Everybody's accepted. You can't tell anybody that they're wrong because that might offend them. Everything's acceptable. God loves everybody. God is love, so everything's acceptable. And people will split hell wide open not realizing truth has not been told. God is a, a loving God. God is a merciful God. God is a good. His goodness is so amazing that humanity can't even compare. The greatest of the great cannot even compare into the context of God's goodness. But don't touch his children. Because he said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If you're a child of God, you ought to smile like he's got your back. You'll quit fighting so hard when you realize, I'm going to give it to Jesus. Cast my care to him and I'll let him deal with it. 
God has a way. I don't know who that's for, but you got to, you'll come into a place of rest knowing that God will deal with them, and they'll come back knocking on your door saying, I am sorry. We'll let God deal with it. Amen. But God tells, tells Egypt, tell Pharaoh, let my, let my people go. We know the story, and then he's bringing them through the process to the promised land. And as he gets close to the promised land, he tells, and this is where we'll pick up in our text, and he gets close to the promised land, we see that he begins to pull Moses aside and say, we're close, I'm not going to go, I'm going to send an angel with you to guide you the rest of the way. Up until then, they had had divine direction and protection as it was a hot day where the sun God would be like a cloud to protect them and shade them and lead them. If it was at night and they needed to move, God would be like a pillar of fire in the sky to illuminate the way and guide them and direct them. Anybody who would try to mess with them, they knew that they, were be, they would be messing with God Almighty because that was the people of God. The stories were told. The nations knew. God was with them. He protected them. He guided them. And he gets to a place, and he tells Moses, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel with you to show you the last part of it. And here we pick up in Exodus chapter 33, verse 16, which I believe is important, the New Living Translation. And Moses says, how will anyone know that you, have, that you look favorably on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people of the earth. One translation, he says, what separates us from all the other nations of the world? What separates you as, and the people of God in this modern day church world? What separates us? Is it the size or the color of our building? Is it the structure of the time that we meet? Is the sound of our music? No, what separates us from all other religions? What separates us from the people of the world? Is not our clothes or our hair or the car we drive. It is the presence of God. It is God's presence. And the world can't figure it out. And the devil hates it. And the world tries to imitate it. Do you realize that even today that there is churches out there. Churches. And there are atheist churches. Listen to me. There are churches right now that have a building. They have a meeting. People come in. They play just secular music. People stand and enjoy. Then someone comes out and gives them a 15-minute self-help, how to improve and be a better person, and they do community outreach together. Everything that almost would look like a normal church except without Jesus. Everything that would look like, oh, this is a good thing. I'm learning how to be a better husband and be a better wife and how to manage my money better and manage my time. And all those things are good in the natural, but if that becomes the pinnacle of even the uh, spirit-filled, born-again teaching, we got issues because it all needs to come down to the foundation of the Word of God and the truth that God is with us. Everything except for Christ. Everything except for Jesus. They take God out of it. When you take God out of it, you can have the shell of appearance of doing right, but without God in it, it's an empty shell. It will not last. Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees, you look the part in the outside, but on the inside, you are dead men's bones, which means there's no life in it. And there's a lot of people who crawl in and out of a church every Sunday, and there's no life on the inside, and it's because they're doing the outside action without the inside revelation. They don't understand. This is more than I'm going to church. This is more than I'm trying to help some children on Christmas time. This is more than I'm giving some money to our. This is a relationship with Jesus. It's a reality. God with you. This is so imperative, so important that Jesus even said, in the last days, many will say, Christ is here, Christ is there, but don't go. In time, I believe we're living in the last times because the Bible is very specific that when, when Peter said and quoted that in the last days, that was the beginning of the last days, it acts. How far are we in now? But we know in the last days, if you look at end time prophecy, it refers to a, a, a person referring to as the Antichrist. 
But many of us have always interpreted that as anti being against. But if you look at the original text, anti doesn't necessarily mean the opposite or against Christ. Anti also can mean instead of Christ. He will set himself up as God, the Bible says, to be worshipped. What is it? He's showing up saying, it's not Jesus, it's me. It's not Jesus, it's me. It's not Jesus, it's me. Follow me, don't follow Jesus. Worship me, don't worship Jesus. Follow, do what I want you to do, don't do what Jesus wants you to do. It's a taking the place of Jesus. How many things in life is trying to take the seat of Jesus in your heart and your life today? We might not see it as a person, but the Bible refers to it as a spirit of antichrist. How many things takes the priority in our routine, in how we spend our money, and how we spend our time, and how we look at life? Don't get quiet on me, church. How many things tries to nibble into the place to see if you're going to keep Jesus, number one, or are you going to let something else come in and say, it's not about Jesus, it's me. Because we can do all the good stuff. We can be, all, be a, a nice, better person. But if we take Jesus out of the equation, what separates the true people of God than anybody else that's playing the game, it's not the title on the building. It's not the title on the person. Because I've seen people with great titles, but no essence. Titles are, can be important, but they also can be detrimental. And it seems like in the church world, people get more caught up with titles than they do actions. They'll want to climb the ladder like they're climbing a corporate ladder in the church world. And they don't mind who they have to take down, who they have to talk about, who they politic against. All because it, it will be good if they come out better and the ends will justify the means. And the truth is it makes God nauseous. You can't do that and expect the pleasure of God in your life, the hand of God. Because God will withdraw his presence. Yes, God is everywhere, but his presence is not manifested everywhere. And you can talk the talk and make it look like you're doing the right thing. But God knows and people will discover the essence of who God is and where he's not. God with us. Moses said, oh God, if you don't go, we don't want to go. Because what separates us from the rest of the world is it not your presence. David understood the, the context of this idea. That he would begin to say, I would rather live in a tent with the presence of God than in the biggest mansion without you. And it's not saying it's wrong to have stuff. It's saying it's wrong to have stuff without him. And just on a side note, all this drama that gets on that talks about prosperity and people bashing or for prosperity gospel. Listen, God wants you blessed. But you know what, I, if you don't believe God wants you blessed, that's fine, live your conviction. What makes me mad is people get on the public platform and a public scene and they'll write books about God doesn't want you blessed, not telling people they're making millions of dollars on selling a book to tell you that God doesn't want you blessed. That makes me mad. People that are against it will not share their bank account or their zip code or their address they live in. The public get up because it's acceptable to say God doesn't want you to have anything, and yet they themselves have a lot. Church world, political world, don't matter. If you don't believe people should be wealthy, I, I, even in the politics, they'll get up and say, oh, we need to, don't get mad at me. We need to tax the rich, and they're the rich. It's not right for the rich to have money, and yet they got five homes. What is up with that? I'll leave that alone. You say, what are you, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Socialist, none of the above. I'm, I'm a Christian first. David understood this context as we move into the closing of this. David understood this context and he'd begin to say, I'd rather be in a, something small with God than something that appeared great without God. David would say, God, take anything away from me, but do not take your Holy Spirit. Do not take your presence out of my life. David understood the gravity and the benefit of God's presence. 
as he penned the phrase, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my fortress, he is my God. What was he saying? Hey, I understand that from the presence of God, everything flows. Money is good, and it's a, it's a tangible authority on this side of eternity. But there's something even greater, and that's the presence of God. Because money can't buy you peace. Again, I'm not against you having money. Money is a tangible, powerful tool. You put money in the right hands, it can do great things. It could feed the hung, hungry. It could buy presents for little children that would have nothing. It can build churches. We just opened up two uh, new churches, and we posted some pictures on Facebook. If you follow us on Facebook, if you haven't, please do. Please like it so you can keep up to date. But we just, uh, two new churches south of General Santos, and they're tribal churches. One's in the mountains, one's in the valley. Pastor Jesse, our national director, we just sent him out there. To take pictures and to minister so you can know some of the things that are going on. Next week, we're, we're partnering with him. Besides, besides the, the feeding of all those families for Thanksgiving and the thousands of pounds we hand out on a regular basis to, uh, to people in our community for, through our food, food pantry. And I'm saying this not to motivate you emotionally to give because the offering's behind us. I don't, use, I don't look for emotional hooks to get you to give money. I look for you to give by obedience to the revelation of God's word. But I also want you to know things that you're doing. Next week, we partnered we partner with them on an outreach. Next week, we're, we're going to be feeding in the Philippines. You didn't realize this. You're not even going. You probably didn't know about it unless I tell you. But we're feeding 500 families in the Philippines next week. Yeah. Yeah. In the community. Not people, families. And preaching the gospel. Stuff is happening on a regular basis. But of all the good stuff, it, we come back to the reality that it's in his presence. The Bible says it's fullness of joy. Moses understood something. God, without you, I don't want it. Because the presence of God will keep you on track. Do you want something for a short season and then the rest of your life you're talking about how good life used to be, the way it used to be, and how you used to have it? Oh, I used to be blessed. I used to be famous. I used to be successful. Those were good days. Or you can live with, with God's presence and he can not only bring you to that place, but he will sustain you in that space. Mm. How do we begin to prepare, how do we get ourselves ready to experience the presence of Jesus even this Christmas time? Starting today, point number one. Are you ready? Say, are you ready? This is the preparation principle. We see in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, verse 15, that when the shepherds heard what the angels said, they, they went. James says, faith without works is dead. James also tells us to draw near to God and he will draw near to us. Matthew 5, 6, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. If we want God's presence in our life. Pastor, I've been saved, but I'm not experiencing God's presence. This is not a woo-woo, this is not a weird thing, this is the reality thing, and if you aren't experiencing God's presence, you can in a greater way, and it starts by you making room for God. I told that funny story, which is a true story, at the beginning of this message about how we had made an agreement, we're going to fill each other's stocking, and I went out and just got a bigger stocking. I made more room for what I was expecting. I made more space for the place of what I was wanting. Most of us, we want, but we don't make any preparation for space or place for God. And I'll tell you, every time you come to church, just don't come because it's Sunday or you should do it. Come with the expectation. I am investing into God because I am making space and a place for God to encounter in my life. I need God's presence. I need to experience Him. I want to know Him. Have the mentality that if I'm not experiencing God the, as much as I want, that the initiation is on my part. I must draw near to him for him to draw near because he's already paid the price. He'll never force himself on you. He just gives you an Im invitation to come. How big is your want to? You say, but pastor, I, I know I need to. But the truth is, let's be real, is I don't necessarily know if I want to. 
I do on Sunday, and then I get out into the world on Monday. I get so caught up with stuff, and I lose my focus. What do I need to do? Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, closing verse, tells us new living. For God is working in you. Say, God is working in me. This is a cool thing because when we have God's presence in our life, catch, catch, what, catch what happens here. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power, one translation says ability, to do what pleases him. The Old Testament says it this way, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Many times in the church world we'll read that, that if I do what God wants me to do, that he's going to give me what I want. But that's not really what's being said. Delight yourself. Spend time in God's presence. Make room for God in your routine and rhythm of life. And he will place in your heart his desires. Back to Philippians. How do I know that to be true? Because of the next verse, it says then, commit your works unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. What is it? The desire he's placed in your heart. God I know I need a desire for you. And Lord, I want a desire for you. But I'm so pulled by other stuff. God, Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Father God, in Jesus' name, I ask you to do a work in my life. Give me a desire for your presence in my life. You can't get any simpler than that. Give me the desire for you. What a prayer. What a powerful prayer. And as you spend time in his presence, all of a sudden it's not you doing a check box, I've got that completed, I've done that, all of a sudden you'll begin to experience that you're experiencing moments that you can experience him. Because at the end of the day, he is here. Will you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one moving around. If you're here today and you do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking you to join a church, denomination, or religion. I'm asking you this one question, a question that only you can define and decide and understand from the context of your heart. No one can tell you this, only you can know it. Is Jesus Christ real to you today? This is more than my name's on a membership. I go to church. This is I know Jesus. He's real to me. He's my Lord and Savior. And the way you process, and the way you experience, and the way you, can, you look at life in a way that you relate, that you can know in your world, and your understanding, that number one, Jesus is real, and two, that he's your Lord and Savior. Your sins are forgiven. Your heart's right. You have a clear conscience with God. Only God can give you a clean, clear conscience. With no one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you don't, the Bible tells us out of Romans 10 that with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Revelation 3, he stands at the door knocking. If you hear his voice and open up, he'll come in. A short, simple, yet powerful prayer can make an eternal difference in your life today. This is your moment. This is your moment. For God is here. If you don't know him that way, I want to encourage you to follow this prayer that I'm going to pray. Say with me from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins was buried for me, and on the third day, rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, forgive me, cleanse me with your precious blood. Say, Jesus, I open up the door of my heart and the door of my life, and I invite you in. To be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Amen. I want you to look up here. If you prayed that prayer, first of all, I want to say welcome to the family of God. Secondly, I want to encourage you. This is the greatest. doesn't mean you don't have obstacles, but you have opportunities for victory because of him and because of the family around you. You're part of a new family. 
You're a brand new creation in Christ. A lot of stuff you might not understand yet, that's okay. Just walk it out through the process. But I also want to pray a blessing over your life before we leave here today. And so if you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, I'm going to, in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. You don't have to come down here. I just want you to stand up. You might say, I'm not comfortable standing up. I understand that. But if this is the worst thing we do to sacrifice, to say, Jesus is Lord of my life, then we're doing pretty good. Because the truth is, if we can't stand up for Jesus in a room that everybody's going to clap and applaud and be proud of you, how do we stand up for Jesus in a world who tries to talk us out of him? So to count of three, if that's you, you say, Pastor, that was me. I was praying, and I'm going to stand up as my inside decision. I'm going to serve Jesus. If that's you, at the count of three, I want you to stand to your feet. One, two, three. Stand to your feet right now. Who am I talking to? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Stand to your feet. Don't, don't be shy. Thank you. People are standing up all over the building. So proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Keep clapping, church. Come on. There's a few people that need to be standing that aren't. Come on, you can do it. Who am I talking to? There's somebody else that we're waiting on. I don't know who you are, but you prayed that prayer. You know you need to stand. Don't worry about anybody else. Who cares what people think? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A few more seconds before we pray. Anybody else? Anybody else? This is, uh, I'm going to make a decision. That's it. We'll stand up for basketball games, football games, baseball games, celebrate our team, but we're going to stand up for Jesus today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm not holding this long for any specific reason except for I feel a tug in my heart. There's somebody even over to my right side. Who are you? We're going to give you a few more seconds. This is so important because it defines your value of Jesus as number one. Who am I talking to? Who's over here? We'll give you a few more seconds. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't let the devil or anybody, pressure from anybody, keep you out. A few more seconds. A few more seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Stretch your hands towards someone if they're near you. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone who's standing up that just received you as their Lord and Savior. Father, and we seal them with the blood of Jesus, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon their life. Lord, we curse and bind every curse or hex that's been spoken against them any time in their past by anyone. And we break them free from all powers of the enemy, all tugs of the devil that would try to keep pulling them back. We set them free into the kingdom of God and the kingdom of light. We loose the anointing upon their life that seal them, set them free, give them a joy and a peace like they've never experienced. We thank you for your salvation. Now, Lord, bring the right people in their path that would be that friend, that would be an anchor and a strength and a motivator to them. And we give you praise. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap.